The broadcast has begun. The video is live. Welcome, Internet. Welcome, Internet. Well, hey, everyone. Uh, my name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your virtual star party for Sunday, December 1st. 1st of December. 2013, the uh, Winter Sucks Edition, I believe is the way I'm going to describe mm-hmm. this. Sad trombone for December. <clears throat> yeah, well, it's apparently some kind of holiday weekend in the states, and uh, and also I, I'm a glutton every week. So I... <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so people are uh, just too loaded down with turkey to reach their uh, computer screens. Also, well, that, and there's some crappy weather. Well, yeah. also, isn't aren't you having like some kind of horrible storm on the east uh, on the east coast? I don't know. I'm on the West Coast. Forget those East Coasters. Yeah, yeah. If you notice, we don't have any East Coasters. <clears throat> Apparently, someone put in a proposal that they should just move Thanksgiving to the summer, because <laughs> like you know, that would be horrible. We haven't figured imagine, out like Im- immensely obese Americans gorging themselves on turkey and falling asleep in the hot summer. <laughs> well, not. Yeah, but but people are traveling in the. You know, it's just like it's just the worst time to travel. Or they can move to Australia. Yeah. I think we've got it figured out in Canada. Just a month earlier. It's not. It hasn't gone full on. Horrible winter storms yet, so Canada can do winter storms. So maybe that's why we do our Thanksgiving a little earlier. Yeah, anyway, but you're not really Canada with winter storms on Vancouver Island. What's a what's a winter storm for you? Some rain. <laughs> oh yeah, some rain. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know what? We actually have some people here. Let's get on with the show. Man, distracting Scott. Hey, uh, it's what distracting I'm Scott. Um, well, hey, we got Gary Ganella back. Yeah. Hi guys. Glad to be back. Where were you, Gary, for those who were um, On a cruise through the Panama Canal from uh, Fort Lauderdale, F- uh, Florida, through the canal, a bunch of stops in between, and ended up in San Diego. Any astronomy happen? None. It, almost every night was cloudy. I, I couldn't even get up and see some, maybe some of the, northern, uh, the southern stuff. We were, we were down to nine degrees north, but none of the nights. It, oh, it, we no. had good days, but, but all the nights were cloudy. But like you could have seen the large Magellanic cloud and things like that. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah. That sent you saw clouds. Yeah. But, amazing. Uh, I saw Sorry. clouds. Yeah. I yes. Saw clouds. Magellan. <laughs> um. And Roy is back. Yes. Hey, Roy. So now you Hello. decided to unleash a brand new uh, setup on us this week. Yes, I did. I got uh, my new mount set up. So uh, I just put the telescope on it. Last night, polar lined it, and I'm going to try some images out of it tonight for the first time. <laughs> well, I'm sure this is going to work out great. Oh, I'm sure it will. <laughs> Let's just make it up. As yeah, we we're not gonna have any, yeah, we'll just swap in some pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope. And <laughs> I can done. do that. I can do yeah. that. Let's do it. Yeah. But what's the, uh, so what's the setup? Like, what specifically did you do to upgrade your experience? So I, uh, I had another mount, which is a Celestron CGE mount. Um, and I took my four mi- or four inch refractor, 106 millimeter refractor, put on there, which I had on my other mount eight nine months ago. Um, put that on there, and so I'm now going to be shooting out of that. So it's about a 700 millimeter field of view. Yeah, it's it's massive field of view. It's yeah. You, you did a, you did a test shot just before we got started, and you did M57, which is one of our favorites, which is the Ring Nebula, and it, <laughs> we could barely tell that it was even inside the... the right, it was just field. a little tiny thing. Yeah, so you're going to be shooting some big, big stuff. Yeah, I think this field of view is comparable to what Gary's field of view is with his Hyperstar. Yeah, I'm shooting it just under 600, so it's going to... or just under 700. Close. Yeah, I'm, I'm, like, I'm like 680 or something. And this is 700. So. And then it's going to come down to the size of the chip is going to make a difference too. Yeah, right. So we're we're close. Pretty close. Uh, and then uh, distracting us is uh, Scott Lewis. I'm also marketing and sharing out the posts everywhere. So no. I'm just here to look good, bring the snarky commentary, and make sure this gets where it needs to be. Perfect. <laughs> One thing we need. One yeah. thing we're a little short of it is it's snarky sar- commentary. Yeah, sarcasm. So you know. Be so kind, Scott. Bring bring it. You know, I'll try. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so uh, so before we get started with the pictures, and so if you've never done this before, what what is what is this? This is the virtual star party, and this is where we hook up a bunch of telescopes into a live Google Plus Hangout on air, and we broadcast the night sky. Whatever's up, that's what we look at, and we'll do our best to explain 
uh, what we're looking at, and, uh, and we're glad to take any requests that you might have. Now, we're going to try an experiment. We've tried this before, and it wasn't super... Uh, sort of didn't work too well, but I think it's starting to work now, um, which is the Q&A app from... Uh, from Google Plus. So, so in theory, and I don't, I'm not even sure like what this looks like. It says that we are taking questions. Oh, here it is. Okay. Yeah. So down at the bottom, if you're watching the video, down at the bottom it says, "Be part of the conversation." Click to join the live Q and A on the Google Hangouts. Okay, you know, I'm going to click my own Q and A, and I'm going to see what this looks like. Are it looks really cool, like? but it's disabled on my Hangout window. So I'm just going to be looking at YouTube in the events. Okay, so this pops up a whole new screen, and on that screen there's a bunch of, the video still runs, and there's a bunch of questions on the side, and I'm going to take one of those questions, and I'm going to select it, so let's see what happens here. So our good friend, Sharon Ahmed, who's in Malaysia, we're going to answer his question. Oh, hey, Shah. How's it going? Yeah. And Shar Sharon? It's, it's Shah. Well, he goes by Shah. Does he Shah? Okay, cool. Yeah. Who we, who we've been trying to connect with for like a year now, and yeah. it just hasn't come together. I've I've been able to do it without you. I, I <laughs> yeah, he's got he's got a great I, setup. He's an amazing uh, astrophotographer. He did a great series of pictures uh, last year about this time where he took a he did a picture of every one of the planets and he put them all into one uh, picture. It was just terrific. So he's a, just an absolutely fantastic astrophotographer. And just attracts horrible weather like some kind of magnet. So, anyway, uh, so anyway, so let's go with the uh, so anyway, so you can use these these QA or there's in the YouTube chat or there's in the uh, on the Google Plus or there's on the event page. Yes. Uh, so we'll try and watch all those locations. All the, the event same time. page and YouTube are gonna be the best, but also with this Q and A app, those watching on YouTube you can't use it until it gets integrated. So, um, oh if really? If you want to use the Q and A app. No, you can now. You can now. It's been integrated now? Yeah, yeah. No, Man, I, I eat turkey for three days, and things change. Yeah, yeah. So I'm looking at it on YouTube, and the uh, Q&A conversation is there. So Right now. Yeah, yeah. And Tom Nathan says, this is much better than the YouTube feed. Here, yes. Here's what... I, we are answering this question from Tom Nathan. Now, is that showing up anywhere on anyone's screen? I don't think it is. Not on ours, although I've got the... Um... I've got the stream running, and I see it. Okay, great. Yeah, all right. So we're, yep, we're currently YouTube answering now. Tom Nathy's question. This is much better than the YouTube feed. Agreed. And then Man. I'm going to answer Eric. Char say hi to Eric Charlie. May as well do. Just give shout-outs. Hey, hey, Eric hey, Charlie. Everyone. How's it going? Thank you so much, and for all your support. Eric has been just terrific at uh, tweeting links to all the videos we've been doing. So there we go. Right on. Okay, cool. Well, this is working. So, so if you want, click on that little be part of the conversation, and we'll be part of the conversation there. This is going to be great. Talk All with right. us. We're lonely. <laughs> no, so, not really. Uh, okay, but, Gary. Yes. This is Andromeda. And M31. This, and a satellite. And the satellites. Uh, that's a two-minute exposure. And uh, while I'm thinking about it, just as a teaser, I need to get with... Uh, with Roy, but I think I may be able to take the tricolor pictures that he was doing. I've been get, doing some research on it. Really? So I may be able to reset my focuser quickly enough. Right, because we were talking about that three. before, right? So that so for people who need to get kind of brought up to speed here, you're using hydrogen alpha. You know, that's what we're looking at right oh, now. I invited Stephen Coates, by the way. Oh, right on! Yay! Yay, Stephen! Um. He's going to bring some more uh, color commentary for us. That's awesome. No, he's bringing some substrate out of the camera. Oh, really? Okay. And Richard Drum, if he's watching, <clears throat> join us too. Um, yeah, so you're using hydrogen alpha, which is great for piercing the terrible light pollution that you have in the Los Angeles area. But when you're doing your nice full color stuff, you're using a bunch of different filters, one for hydrogen alpha, one for... Oxygen. Sulfur and one for sulfur, sulfur and oxygen. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then you pull those three together, and then use like the Hubble palette, mm -hmm. and you make a full color image with these three, these three filters. And the problem is, and so Roy kind of blew our minds a couple of weeks ago, where he was doing really quick images with three different, um, uh, with these three different filters, and producing a full color image really quickly, but at really high resolution. And I'm like, Gary, could you do this, please? <laughs> And, so I uh, did some research. Yeah. 
And what? And what's? And so what's the? And your your issue, right, was that you couldn't focus. You had to, you have to change your focus when you change your filter, right? Right, right. But I but I think what I'm going to go through is I'm going to calibrate my focuses, and I think the offset is yeah. constant enough that I can move it, take it, move it, and then move it back. If you have an automatic focuser, Maximal will also allow you to set the filter offsets. So as soon as it changes it, mm -hmm. it'll automatically change your your focus for you. Yeah, and that's what I want to get with that, and I want to get with uh, how you did that in Maxim. So it, at some point when we're not working or doing other things, yeah, we need to hang out. Cool. I can't wait if you can figure that out. That would be that would be unbelievable. I invited Tom Nath. He, he's he can deliver us so much uh, color commentary as well. So uh, so Stephen, where are you located? I'm in Ocala, Florida, which is about an hour north of Orlando. I don't think we've done a hangout before yet. No, I don't, this is my first time here. This is awesome. um, I'm I'm stuck inside. There's no uh, we're you know under mm. a nice cloud deck, so I'm not able to do much outside tonight. But I do have some subs over the past weekend, so oh, that'd be great. Show. Yeah, yeah, uh, by all means, put up some pictures, and then we'll uh, we'll start to talk about them. Excellent. Awesome. And Tom, how's it going? You're muted. I have muted you. There we go. There we go. Turn the microphone on. And I'm going to invite Richard Drum if he's watching because he's a party as well. Party. Um, party. We did a virtual star party. A virtual star party, yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's okay, so, thing. all right. So I'm going to move to, well, Stephen's already posted an image. So let's take a look. Oh, let's finish talking about Gary's picture here yeah. first because this is a terrific view of, uh, of the Andromeda Galaxy. And again, that's a two-minute exposure bin four by four, and I got a satellite going through it. <laughs> Yay! Right up here. Where so I'd it? like to describe Andromeda, the Andromeda galaxy, as the most distant object that you can see with the unaided eye, and yeah. it's uh, what's it, two and a half million light years away from Earth, and it's on a collision course with yes. uh, with the Milky Way. And so in approximately, what, 4 billion years or so, it's actually going to slam into the Milky Way. And the two galaxies are going to sort of mash into each other and eventually will... I guess no one can see because now we've got the screenshot. Anyway, the two, the two galaxies are going to mash into each other and will merge. Mm -hmm. And right now they're these, both sort of these beautiful grand spiral designs, but when they're done with each other... We're going to get this big irregular galaxy that will look more like a, just a big swarm of, of buzzing bees. Yeah, it's going to go from having these grand spirals to, you know, you know, smashing into each other is kind of a, a stretch because there's so much space between them. You're going, they're going to kind of wet between and come back and eventually perform something a big elliptical galaxy at the very end, which is what we think that these ellipticals came from are two grand spirals that eventually merge after some perturbation with merging into one another. Yeah. So like two swarms of cosmic bees flying into one another. Uh, so we've got a question here um, from Morello Benoit. I'm gonna, all right, I can select this. This is so cool. Okay. From Morello Benoit, what is the bright star object just south of Altair right now? So Altair is one of the big stars of the Summer Triangle. So I mean, it, and it's you have to give us some more specifics because Jupiter. No, Jupiter is sort of rising in the east right now, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, the Summer yeah. Triangle is kind of going down in the west. So. Oh, Venus. Yeah, Venus is setting. Yeah, around. the brightest thing out there is Venus right now. Yeah, so that would be Venus. So here I'll, I'll put it up on Stellarium. We'll take a look at it. So here's Altair. Mm -hmm. Right up on here, and Venus is down here, setting over here in California, at least. There you go. That's got to be it. And Venus is incredibly far south right now. It's one of the most south that it's been in a lot of years. So it's sort of surprisingly south. Usually you really see it in the in the west, but it's quite surprisingly off. So, I'll sorry, take a south. pizza, Gary. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm going to move to uh, to Stephen's picture, and I'm going to mute Gary. This is Gary? Yeah, this is Gary. All right, yeah. hold on. Gary. Hello, this is Doug. <laughs> <laughs> so, Stephen, now can you try, like, full-screening this picture? 
Uh, this is the best I can do right yeah. now. Um, I, how's it showing up? Is it showing well, up? Well, you're getting a, you're getting like sort of a lot to the right hand side of this. So, can you go to yeah. f- go to view and try full screening it? If I go to view, yeah. full screen. You haven't done this before, so. No, I haven't. So this is. Yeah, excuse me. It looks That's like it. Yeah, this is. This is uh, w- what I've got um, as far as present, uh, presenting it for right now. Um, but this is uh, NGC 891, and this was imaged over the, uh, the this past weekend. And what I did, this is one single six-minute sub. And what I did here is here's um, a cleaned-up image where I have a, maybe three hours of subs all stacked together to uh, reduce the signal-to-noise ratio. I'll switch over to that. And what were you using here, Stephen? The, the telescope. The telescope and camera, yeah. The telescope is an uh, um, uh, eight-inch RCT, Richie Creation, and the camera is a QSI cooled uh, CCD camera. Wow. Oh, cool. yeah, yeah, we've had a QSI on here before. There, they make some really good stuff. Well, yeah, depending on what you're wanting to do. Yeah, and I mean, this is being in Florida where it's so stinking hot. I mean, it is just roasting down here. So I was imaging with a DSLR for the longest time, and I'm unable to, you know, cool a DSLR. And as, you know, the weather warms up starting in January, it does uh, tend to get a lot of heat noise, a lot of um, a, a lot of uh, just grubby looking images. So I had to go with a cooled CCD route. That looks great. Yeah. I, I love how we can really see the dust lanes in there. Yeah, really yeah. Including, yeah. Uh, the I mean, this bowls. is great. I mean, this is another example of a of a grand spiral galaxy, but we're seeing it edge on, and so we're seeing that that dark dust lanes that run right across the uh, the middle of the galaxy there. But you can see the bulge above and below the that central line. Great picture. Thanks. Can you? Uh, Sorry, we didn't get a time to practice before. Can you try like widening it? Because sort of a lot of your screen, like we're seeing yeah, a lot that's of. That's what happens. I, oh, I, I see. Been with yeah. it for a while, and that's why I was I was late to the party because I was trying to play around it with how to try to get this to widen up for you. Well, but, if if you have some other imaging software that would let you just show just this image and then sort of full screen that. Yeah, can yeah. you export the image? Yeah. That might, um, that might be something. This is a fit file, so um, let me see. Like, can you export it as like a? Yeah, something you can bring up in some other program so that you can full screen. Yeah. Because then, you, then you'll lose all that menu bar and stuff. And that's also, what, yeah. It's yeah. also sort of trying to battle the resolution of the of the screen as opposed to sort of trying to make it full screen. We, we deal with this a lot. Yeah. Um, what software are you move... using to display your FIT file? This is Maxim. Yeah. Go on to Maxim and do a file save as. Look at that. And you can specify the... Save as type, do JPEG. All right. Uh, oh, we got a question here. Let's go. Um, so, Arstro Saw says, do elliptical galaxies revert back to spiral at some point, or do they stay elliptical? And uh, no, that's a that's a one way trip. So you can kind of imagine it, right? You've got with the grand spiral, all of the material came together all sort of in roughly the same line and all lined up and then formed this big spiral shape. But when you get these elliptical galaxies, you've got two really big galaxies coming in at opposite angles, and so you're just losing all of that structure and you're just getting the, this big buzzing ball of stars. And I'm going to try to pull up something here because I love this animation. Let's see if I can find it. Sure, and I've gone to Roy's image. Roy's single color image. Yes, you're not going to let me live that down, are you? <laughs> <laughs> well, you had cracked the code, dude. You had you had figured out how to pull full color images out of your setup. So Yes. As so soon as I right. get the guiding set on this one, it'll do the same thing. So, so what do we got? This is M27, which is n- a little blurry. <laughs> yeah, I can see the stars are a little uh, blobby, too. Yeah. Yeah, so on the uh, galaxies, uh, getting back to that, I don't mean to discount the dumbbell number here. My, uh, Scott, you might want to explain why dust lanes are important for galaxies. Why don't you what that does. Tom? Why don't I? Why don't you? No. 
<laughs> you know, when when we have the dust, I mean, it, the, that's where all of our stellar systems come from. So when you have these these really thick, dense group, you know, groups of dust, and they have to be cold because if it's hot, it's actually going to heat up too fast and actually disperse. So you need to have this cold, dense gas to be able to come in down on itself to be able to create these protostars and the accretion disks, which is where these stellar nurseries are from. So like the Orion Nebula, for instance, is a, a great example of the stellar nursery of this cold dust that's collapsing down in itself, creating these really magnificent, beautiful stars. One of the things that's really interesting about the, the shape of the galaxies when we see these spiral arms, you know, you think that they're they're like, I don't know, like an octopus, right? This sort of rotate or a pinwheel that's rotating, right? But in fact, it's actually the area where the uh, where we're seeing those spiral arms are density waves that are moving through the galaxy. And so it's not actually the stars in those like you're not seeing the star turn the galaxy turn like this. You're actually seeing these density waves move through the galaxy and as they pass through these areas, they're causing star formation. Within the within the spiral arms, yeah, that that's really fascinating. It, 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 it's, it's a hard concept for me to understand, but yeah, doing the density waves as opposed to the thing physically rotating. Um, so we got here a question from Jamie Orlando. So is Ison officially toast? No, it's officially a comet. <laughs> Toast. Can, can you dig up? There's, there's a great video. Let me see if I can dig that video up while we look at, at uh, Gary's next image. Actually, I was going to uh, show this galaxy collision real quick. Too. Okay, and then I'm going to dig up an image of of Ison's current status. Uh, yeah. But it appears sort of. It appears that yeah, it's toast in that it it went around the sun, it got torn apart, and now it's sort of a puffball that's moving away from the sun. So it's not going to be the comet of the century. So. Or it's also not going to be this terrible destructive force that's going to bring, a, bring about the uh, end of civilization in a new enlightenment. So, yeah. Um, also, no spaceship behind it. <laughs> no, yeah, everyone deleted those from the images. As a you know, seven billion people got together and deleted them from all of them. It's I'm so glad all the conspiracy theorist stuff is should be done with ISIS. Should be. Yeah, we, that's we it. We got a now, lot of right. it. Now, yeah. so can you run that again? So now yeah. that that this has sort of gone away, you're right. Now the conspiracy hoax people aren't going to try and <laughs> this next comet. They did it with Elenin. They did it with McNaught. Right. They killed themselves with Hale Bop. So. Yeah, I I call it the Smucker Space crap because now it's toast. So they're <laughs> sending jam after it. <laughs> Okay, so that is, that's awesome, Scott. So, that's yeah, this, this is simulation. some actual observation. Well, these are actual observation mixed with some simulation going oh, on. So cool. these are some observed collisions going on at different stages that they've been able to see how it goes into an elliptical galaxy, which I think is fantastic. So being able to use things like Hubble and many of the grand observatories are able to see the evolution of spiral galaxies turning into... These uh, these elliptical galaxies. That's fantastic. I want that video. Who who did that video? Was that an ESA video? Uh, no, well, I'm sure he took it from there. It's uh, Frank Summers. Channel. That's amazing. Cool. Um, okay, I'm going to show you a picture of sort of what uh, the comet looks like right now. Let's see. Let's and see so this. yeah, NASA and ESA. So this is from Phil Plate. Uh, added the arrow. <laughs> so, so you can see the credit uh, of the arrow goes to yeah, the bad yeah, astronomer. Just so we're clear, thank you, Phil Plate. Um, yeah, I think this is Phil's too. Let me see if I can do this one. Okay, here, let me try this. Hold on. Um, let's try this. Best television ever. No dead air. I'm going to sing it. Okay, here we go. Okay, so here's Phil Plate, my good friend. Phil Plate sometimes joins us on the Virtual Star Party, and uh, he got these videos. He's got some sound, too. I don't know if this is coming through. Nope. Just barely. Puff. I'm, I'm hearing it from your microphone. Oh, that looks great. <laughs> 
Thank you, iMovie. This is awesome. <laughs> oh, Phil. Yeah, that's not looking hopeful for anything yeah. long term. You can uh, find more Phil Plate at badastronomy.com. Yep. <laughs> He's on <laughs> Slates and Twitter. Yeah, yeah. And sometimes at the Virtual Star Party. Sometimes, yeah. We need to get him back. We I'll let him there. know that he was in the Virtual Star Party tonight. He'll be glad. He was able to make a, make a yeah. show. Um, he right, better Gary. be. We're going back to your view here, Gary. What is this? Ah, this is the Galaxy M33. Again, with... Uh, Looks like a snap might be an airplane because it's short. It was <laughs> short airplanes. Right there. And oh, again, yeah. Another satellite. But that's the two minute exposure, so the satellite should have traveled most of the way across the frame in two minutes. Have also, you got a little, a little fog little there tonight? There's a little some white high clouds. A little fog, some high clouds yeah, there tonight? Yeah, I've got uh, high clouds floating through. Yeah. I haven't looked to see if it's right where I'm looking, but. So we're yeah, looking at M33, right, Gary? M33, yes. Right. Yeah. We're looking at the Triangulum Galaxy. Uh, Shaw says that, uh, here we go, I think Comet <clears throat> 154P Brewington is pretty high up right now. Maybe we can give it a try. Yeah, maybe we can. That would be awesome. Uh, we'll yeah. Jump in whenever you have clear skies. <laughs> yeah, because we have two astronomers with really big, wide fields of view. So yeah. getting a comet right now is going to be pretty difficult. Yeah, unless it's just the comet of the century, so... Which Eisen was not. Yeah. They were promising. Uh, oh, and yeah, it was the com uh, comment of the season. If you didn't get the link, um, I was uh, I was on I was interviewed on the Discovery Channel, the Canadian version of the Discovery Channel. They do a science so show. Is, is it Discovery A? Eh? Discovery A, eh? yeah, yeah, Daily Planet, <laughs> and uh, and it was the November twenty eighth episode, and so I was in a uh, yeah I was in an episode and answering some questions about Comet Eisen. You know, if if you give me the link, I'll put it in the doobly doo. In the doobly doo, <laughs> sure. Um, it's in. I think I tweeted it. I'll, I'll look tweet. it up. Yeah. I'll look it up. All right, I'm gonna go to uh, to Stephen's latest. Oh, nice. This is uh, what is this? This is NGC Pac 281 Pac-Man Nebula in Cassiopeia. So this is uh, another uh, stack of. Hydrogen and alpha images, I took 20-minute subs, and this is three hours' worth of these subs all mashed together. Oh, nice. Uh, just for funsies, this is what the sub looks like right out of the camera. So this is the 20-minute sub, and then at a later date, you're able, I'm able to go ahead and stack everything together and start working off of that. Now, when you say sub, what do you... That's having the shutter open for 20 minutes. That, that's what we call a sub. So the, the shutter stays open for 20 minutes. It tracks this nebula for a full 20 minutes with the shutter wide open, collecting all the light. And and do you and then you stack them? You stack a, you take a bunch of them, or you just do one 20 minute exposure and then do a different color? No, okay, that's exactly what we do. So we, I take a, a 20 minute exposure and stack those. So uh, this is three hours worth of 20 minute exposures. Right. And then this is just through the H alpha filter. I also use uh, S2 and O3 filters. Uh, to fin to add color to the the final product. Yeah, and that's the same that's the same setup that Gary's got. He's got those three filters. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Yeah. In my skies, I mean, I got I have brutal um, just light polluted skies. I have two street lights in my backyard. Um, I have a, a vo professional sized volleyball court next door to my na uh, my neighbors have. So. <laughs> yeah, so you, you said you're near I'm, Orlando. Do you have any wow. problems with Disney? <laughs> not, not necessarily Disney, but I mean, you know, the air, they get a lot of air traffic, so there's yeah. a lot of air, airports. Um, uh, John Travolta has an air community just north of me. Travolta? About five minutes. Travolta. <laughs> <laughs> got a lot of mice problems. <laughs> so people are apparently able to vote up questions, so everyone wants to see that Tom Nathy will do astronomy for food. So. Nice. So Tom, I hope you uh, I hope you fed well this weekend to the evening. Oh, sort of, kinda. I'm uh, I went over for uh, turkey dinner for, with friends of mine. So there we go. Uh, but then I got a cold and can't do much of anything else now. 
Um, I've got a question from Joseph Sardina. Uh, what mount is he using? So now I know Roy, you mentioned you've got this Celestron CG. Yeah. Um, and what have you got, Stephen? Uh, this is a Lasman D G11. Okay. Yeah, that's a pretty nice setup. An eight-inch Richie Crichton. That's a pretty fancy telescope you've got there. It's it's. It's fun. I'm having a good time with it. I, got, I have two girls, one on the way, so I'm, I'm a home guy. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, Although this time of year, the, the kids do turn feral, so I haven't paid much attention to them. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, Ron Burke asks, uh, is the Sculptor Galaxy too low to view from your locations? Where is the Sculptor Galaxy right now? I don't know. I don't know. Isn't that more of a summer... That is mainly galaxy. Oh, it's it's up. Let me see if I can oh. grab it here. There we go. Up down under. NGC two five three. Yep. It's uh, in the consecration sculptor. Sculptor. Yep. Yeah. Imagine that. Well, hence the name. Is that is that why the Andromeda Galaxy? Yeah. Named the Galaxy in Andromeda. So there's so the there's, sculptor. So and this is from LA. So it is up right now. How close to the horizon is it? So here's the southern horizon right here. We have Cetus. It's not too bad. It's, it's not terrible, but it's not great because we have Zenith way up here. Gary, do you want to take a crack at it maybe? Which, which one are we looking at? The NGC 253. Uh, 253, okay. Cool. All right, I'm going to go back see to what the I can do. Here. Let's see what we got. Now, I did see a question in the Q&A app. Uh, let's see, what's the difference between... Uh, that wasn't the question. It changed. Uh, someone was asking about how dense outer space is between galaxies. It's about, um, it is, memory serves me right, it's one atom of hydrogen uh, per cubic um, per cubic meter. So one atom per cubic meter, which is pretty uh, not dense at all. So because there's space dust and there's all sorts of crazy stuff going on out there, but we're, you know when we're not when there's so much space in between, you might get dust, but there's so much stuff that it you know groups together because of gravity, you know. So that's why we have galaxies and things like that. And over around 14 billion years, things are starting to clump together more than it was and when the Big Bang happened. Yeah, I'm planning on doing a, a video on that. Actually, I've got that on my list. Nice. So. How dense is space, or how much stuff is there in space? Um, so, Gary, I don't recognize this. This is one I don't think we've done before. This is IC59, which is the Gamma Cass Nebula in Cassiopeia. And again, that's a two-minute uh, bin 4x4 four four in hydrogen alpha. That is great. That is really nice. This This requires further investigation, I think. Yeah, I just poking around and saw it there and thought we'd uh, we'd give it a shot. This is done in uh, H alpha. Yes. Ah. Yeah, I take that. Cool. Oh, and that's nice. Have What's you got the a bright star? Um, I was afraid somebody's going to ask me that. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that's um, okay. I can't find out. But it looks, it looks like it's ionizing the gas there. That's what that's why I was wondering. Yeah. It looks like they're yeah, close parts. It's in Cassiopeia, so it's. Nappy. I gotta open up my. I think that's sigma cas. Gamma cas. Oh, yeah. Say gamma cas. Yeah. Yep. Navi probably. Yeah. It's yeah. never never land. Uh, I got a question here. Bobby White asks, "What kind of science can be done with amateur astronomers with images like the ones we're being shown? Can you sell stellar composition, age, etc.?" Um, not much. Not with images per se. Yeah. You can do photometry if you have a pretty good mount. And CCD chip. I know there's the AAVSO that does actual science from amateur astronomers. Yeah, but the problem I, I, oh. is that sort of the setup that 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 they're using is really to to make it look visually aesthetically pleasing, but not to collect science. In many cases, the kinds of images they use to collect science are not that aesthetically pleasing. So, um, you know, I know that scientists wouldn't be able to sort of use these images for for their work. Oh yeah, I mean, if you look at the the raw Hubble data, it's not pretty. Yeah, it's not pretty at all. But there, it, there, but there, I mean, there is amateur. a book. Oh, sorry, what's that? There Go ahead. A, oh, there is a book that's called "The Sky Is Your Laboratory," 
that is geared for doing amateur research because there is quite an effort underway for doing uh, professional amateur collaboration. And uh, what was this guy's name? Buckheim, I think. Um, he wrote this book uh, that goes through the soup, the nuts, everything from uh, asteroid occultations where you got uh, uh, asteroids passing in front of stars and, and amateurs can collect that data so that they can see size and shapes of asteroids all the way to doing um, exoplanet transits so that the professionals can get a better understanding of what uh, these planets are doing as they pass in front of a uh, whole star. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really important to, to get across here that it's not that amateurs can't participate with astronomy. They absolutely do. I mean, just all of the astronomers who are discovering supernovae and comets and asteroids, and as you said, right, astronomers are doing, they're discovering extrasolar planets. They're helping with gravitational microlensing. So uh, some are doing variable star astronomy. So there's so if you're an amateur astronomer and you've got a telescope and you want to participate in science, there are tons of projects you can get involved in. It's just that the images that 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 amateurs take that look pretty aren't that useful for science. Right. So, right. Yeah. There, there's a difference between pretty pictures and scientific pictures. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to move over to Roy's view. What is it? That is a portion of NGC 7000, which is the North American Nebula. Oh. So you're looking basically around 5 o'clock. There's Florida and the Gulf of Mexico. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's real close to my field of view, Roy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so just to give people sort of a sense of this, um, you could fit the moon, the full moon, probably three times along sideways and twice up and down in this image. So yeah. it's a gigantic field of view. And the same thing that, uh, that Gary has. Both of them have really wide field of view, fields of view. What's your field of view, Stephen? Uh, my field of view is about a quarter of the moon is what I can get. Right. Shoot, I, I had it written down. I've, shoot. I'm, yeah, so um, you can imagine here, right, the, the whole moon, his image here use four of these images to fill up the moon. So he gets a much sort of narrower field of view. Yeah. My, wow. my field of view is it's a 28 uh, by 38 arc minutes for yeah. my image scale and the camera. Wow. Yeah. Um, oh, so here's a Zen floater says, and so if you're not pretty, you must be a scientist. There you go. I Ouch. resemble that. Oh, <laughs> well, that. wait a minute. <laughs> You always say you're so pretty, Scott. So I know. Um, but now I'm yeah, going I've, evil I've with some, my Heisenberg. I've, yes, I've I've heard several comments, seen several comments about Scott uh, from uh, some of the, uh, the women in the G plus community. Right, the fans. There you go. Yeah, my fangirls. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah my fangirls. fangirls. And fanboys. I don't judge. Um, <laughs> so Gary's got a view of also the Pac-Man, maybe? Yeah, right? since Steven brought that up with the stacked, I figured I'd just oh, give a comparison right. of a, a, a two-minute oh. uh, bin 4x4. Four four. And another satellite. Is there one in there? Yeah. yeah. Yep. Oh, yeah, there it is. So <laughs> yeah, right there. That's funny. There's a whole bunch of those things up there. Yeah. Hey, where's your satellite filter? Can we get one of those? Uh, I had I forgot to turn it on. Oh, okay. Uh, Tom week. Watson says, uh, "So is the comet going to be doing a flypast now in pieces, and should I be expecting cloudy with a slight possibility of comet residue?" Um, we don't know. We have no idea what's going to happen now with this comet, and that is just the most honest answer. We've, you know, this weekend what happened with it flying around the sun and then turning into a puffball that was unexpected. The way it's been flaring, all unexpected. So, probably at this point, it looks like we won't. It won't be a, a naked eye comet. It's probably going to be, you know, binocular object for a little while when it does pop out of the sort of the view of the sun, the glare of the sun. But uh, we still don't really know. So it could surprise us, and it might just just disappear, and that'll be that. Yeah. Yeah, I don't even think there. It, well, it's going to be so far away from us anyway that even uh, any possibility of a small meteor shower from the dust trail probably won't even occur. 
No, I don't think he was. He was thinking that we were going to interact with it in any way. I mean, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty far away from us. But um, uh, Edward Henry asks, what is the difference between hydrogen alpha imaging and imaging with a monochrome camera? Does the HA pick up more detail? So uh, yeah, it's not that it picks up more detail; it's that we're getting a very narrow part of the spectrum of light with hydrogen alpha, whereas monochrome is just black and white. So when we're doing hydrogen alpha, that we're getting a very specific, small, tiny, tiny sliver of the spectrum, which means that any other light that's being emitted in the area is not being picked up at all. Which is why it's great for Gary here in the Los Angeles area, because there's all this crap light pollution. Luckily, there's not an, there's not many things giving off light in the hydrogen alpha wavelengths out here in, in LA, unless you know you have a, a neighbor that's going kind of crazy with the party. <laughs> <laughs> with hydrogen alpha light set up, yeah. 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 I'm going to move next door to you, Gary, just for that, and just blast one. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Right, and so with, with Gary's view, with the, with visible light, like if he switched, the, the camera is the same. So you use the same camera with different filters in front of it, and in this case, what Gary does is he filters out everything except for this one tiny wavelength of, of light so that you get the stuff that doesn't get um, hit with the light pollution. I know that, but you can you can also um, you can also uh, image during when the moon gets full too. So it kind of extends your the time that you can image during the month. Yes, yes absolutely. And um, here I'm going to bring something up. Uh oh, yeah, I'm and, up. and the H alpha filter is physically looks red. It's at the red end of the spectrum. Yeah. 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 Right. This yeah. is um, oh, this is basically visible light. Is that showing up? Yes, yeah. it is. Yes. Yeah. So you go from Perfect. the ultraviolet, the blues, down to the red, and this isn't exact, but it's a very narrow spot right here is where hydrogen alpha is. Uh, if mm -hmm. you look at this whole thing, it's five about 250 nanometers from blue to red, and the filters I'm using right now are 12 nanometers of that. So if you take that scale and you just chop out a little tiny 12 nanometer piece right there, it lets that light through and nothing else. And then sulfur is over here. So when sulfur is excited and glows, it produces this color. And then oxygen produces this blue-green over here. So when we combine the three pictures, uh, you heard Fraser say the Hubble palette, uh, every color picture needs to be have red, green, and blue in it. So what the Hubble palette does is it maps the hydrogen as green, the sulfur is red, and the oxygen is blue. So the sulfur and the oxygen are pretty close to their real colors. And then the hydrogen becomes the green in the picture so that you get a full color image, but it's a false color. Right. Yep. No, that, that's okay. a good chart. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. This, this is a presentation I put together about a year ago for my club. Yeah, it looked like it was a presentation from your astronomical society. Yep. yep. Uh, Roy, what do we got now? The bubble? That is the bubble. Nice. It's so... such a huge field of view. There's like another... <laughs> there's a star cluster in there as well. Yes, there is. Don't ask me which one. I... <laughs> I'll find out. I can't wait until you've had a week to tinker with this telescope. That looks so cool. Can you actually enhance and magnify it all, or use it? I can. Uh, I can embiggen this one. Is that shot binned at all, Roy? That's two by two. Okay. That's impressive. And hydrogen alpha. Artie <laughs> Brewer asks, "Why does Jabba the Hutt?" Like scantily clad women and not scantily clad slugs. Good question. That's a fantastic question. That, that's a puzzler that is because us. because Job is a fan of interspecies erotica. I don't know. And I think that's what it is. <laughs> um, uh, so Tom Watson asks, can you expand on how different scientific astronomical pictures and what information can be gleaned from them in comparison to amateur pictures? Well, part of it is just the fact that the professional the professional images are done with gigantic telescopes, so they're usually done with much, much higher resolution telescopes, much larger aperture. They're, you know, meter and above telescopes. You know, the biggest telescopes that they can use can be 10 meters across. 
But the other thing they're doing is really, in many cases, going for very narrow uh, wavelengths. So just like the hydrogen alpha, they're going for very, very sort of thin slices of the spectrum to try and reveal different kinds of, of material. So, um, you know, in many cases, they'll just go in and they'll just go after this one wavelength that they're looking for, and they're not going to, you know, the pictures are just, as, as Scott says, they're not going to look very nice. I wonder and, what, and they're not. You know, they yeah. we've done a we've done a hangout on the Hubble Space Telescope channel. We've done a hangout on what it what you have to do to take these raw, ugly images and turn them into you know what becomes desktop wallpapers for everyone across the world. And it, there's a lot that goes into it, but it you have to go through and remove cosmic rays because you're you're not having you're not protected by the atmosphere anymore. You have a lot of stuff interacting with your with your uh, camera up there. So they go and do a lot to be able to clean it up and make it something really pretty. Yeah. So in many cases, they when when they're doing their observations, they know the question they're trying to answer. Like, uh, you know, what kind of gas? Is there clumps of hydrogen gas? What's the structure? Things like that. And then they're they're t they're setting their telescope and they're setting the filters. In many cases, they're using different wavelengths, using infrared instead of. Uh, visible light or, you know, different spacecraft use ultraviolet. So there's just, you know, just very specific questions that they're looking to answer and they're not necessarily trying to create an image that looks nice. When you put together, like, a nice full-color image, you're actually sort of removing a lot of the data that they would be really interested in because you're sort of mashing it between these, you know, multiple colors all at the same time. Right. Um, okay, I'm going to go to Gary's view here. And this, that's the, the request, the special request. That is the request, the NGC 253. There you go. Right on. So it came out pretty good. That is a one-minute exposure. Um, Yay! You can start to see at the bottom the light I'm losing. I'll, uh, I'll show you this here real quick. I don't think we've seen this one before. No. Find the right really cool. screen. Even um, the left screen would work. Um, while you're looking. Uh, there we go. Edward Henry asks, uh, what would be the best bang for the buck hydrogen alpha filter to use on my Edge HD and Mallinkam camera without having to rob a bank to afford it? Yeah, these these H alpha filters are expensive. Yeah. Yeah, yeah they're 200 plus each. So right. if you have a Mallinkam, I mean, come on, you can get an H alpha. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just, just for reference, by the way, this is how low I am to the horizon shooting this thing. Holy cow. Yeah, you know, I can't go too much lower and not hit trees. <laughs> so that's the live view of the scope. With with the Malacan, uh, that's an inch and a quarter uh, nozzle on that thing. So you know you can go over to Orion or uh, uh, Lumicon or anything like that and and get uh, a fairly decent. I, I use the Orion. Uh, uh, H-alpha filters, and they seem to work very well for, for what they have, and I think the price is like around $100, $120, something like that. For H-alpha? Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, yeah I mean, you're looking for, at... For, for a small one, it's, it's reasonable. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you're looking at in the hundreds, and in, even in the high hundreds, if it's a pretty nice quality one, so... Exactly, yeah. If you start getting into the really narrow bandwidth... Uh, you know, like the one or two nanometers, then yeah, you're up in the nosebleed section. But if yeah. you get like a ten nanometer uh, for general usage, it'll work fine. I've I I have an old Malacam that I've put H alpha on, and I was doing the the horsehead nebula uh, from the backyard of a light polluted house without any trouble at all. So it it, it works. Um, Zakaria. Hi G asks, Ison Comet Exploit Ratty. So I 42. 42. So yeah, so from what we can tell, um, Ison has mostly disintegrated. And from this point on, it's probably going to be a binocular object and will probably fade away. But if we're lucky, it'll flare up again. So um, I think that was the gist of the question that he was asking. Um, uh, there was another question here that I wanted to run. Okay, so uh, Frostbite says, regarding simulations for galaxy-type creation, elliptical to spiral, would galaxies orbiting each other create arms from ellipticals at each close pass of the orbit after multiple passes and pull out the mid-material out of the edges to create ring galaxies? So I, that's, you'd have to talk to a, um, 
uh, an actual PhD astronomer who works on this, but but from when when we see these comets in Scott, that was sort of the image that Scott showed. Is you see these tidal tails. So as these comets come into each other, they'll tear off these these streams of stars that will sort of stretch out in between them and create these tidal tails. And then these tiles, these tails kind of come back down and splash back into the galaxies and you get these irregular shapes to the galaxies. But that's very different from when these big galaxies merge with each other and create these sort of the final situation is this sort of ball-shaped galaxy. So I don't know if that helps. Yeah, there's there's a couple of uh, simple simulations that you could play, you know, set up the criteria, have one a small high-density galaxy go through a larger low-density galaxy and actually punch out the center. Wow. It's, yeah, it, it, you know, so you, you know, you could play God and you just sit there and destroy uh, galaxies to your heart content. I have to um, look that up. I, I I don't know what the name of that is though. That's really cool. Um, and Stephen, which sorry, which one was this again? This isn't this, a different object, is it? This is a uh, this is uh, Malat fifteen, which is in the Heart Nebula in Cassiopeia. Oh, that looks beautiful. Yeah, this is um. Let's see here. This is a, another 20-minute uh, exposure, you know, and this is a stack of uh, three hours of 20-minute exposures again, like my other images. And then um, the final image once again had the O3 and the S2 uh, filters. Uh, I, I used uh, S2 and O3 filters to finish the image for the colors. This is just the H alpha, though. Excuse me. Tom, I'm meeting you from typing. <laughs> <laughs> um, we we do that. We we have a low tolerance for typing noises, but okay, everyone can unmute themselves. Um, that's sorry about cool. that. No, no problem. Um, okay, great. Well, I think we're we're we need to start wrapping things up. I actually have to go pick up someone from the airport, so I better go wrap this up. Um, one last question here uh, from David Trog. Um, Further on the scientific imaging, can a normal camera, a DSLR, do fits images, and and what are those? So, so Stephen, can a normal like a DSLR do fits images? No, uh, DSLRs will uh, give the uh, raw images. You'll be imaging in raw images, and that'll give you all the information that you could possibly use to process uh, in uh, a program like Photoshop. And so, what's a fits image compared to what a raw image is? Ah, boy, that's uh, that's. Whatever, that's just the images that come out of the CCD camera. I, I, I don't have much more to the offer than that. This image is, is an astronomical format. It's a flexible image transport mm -hmm. system. I believe that's what it stands for. That sounds it. Yeah, that's it. That they're like TIFF images inside there, but they're mainly meant for astronomical images. Most cameras are not going to support them directly. Usually the software does. It saves it that way. But I think the later SBIGs, actually will allow you to save directly to a, a FITS image. Yeah, um, uh, I have an ST8, and that's what, exactly what it does. Okay, yeah. I, I, I think my, my uh, STT8300 will as well, but I don't really do it because the software does it for me. But, I mean, these are the same... It, that's the same format that professional astronomers use. So, I mean, they're using FITS images as well. Yeah, because most of the astronomical software is built around that file format because it will store a bunch of extra data in it and most right. of the software is ready for processing that type of image. Yeah, that's, that's with all the, the data that we have available on Hubble that, that we release to the public, that's what it's all in. So you need to learn all the you know, DS9 and everything like that you need to be able to process those images because you can process your own Hubble data at home because it is open to the public, but it is in this really uh, obscure file format that not everybody's used to using. Usually, yeah. if you find something that's in a FITS image, you can You're gonna find have a fit. software that will transfer that into a TIFF, which then Photoshop or photo editing software will deal with. Right. Very cool. Okay, so why don't we... It looks like we've, we're out of images. Oh, Gary's got one more. I'm going to go to that, and then we're going to wrap this up. Gary, what is this? This is um, Caldwell 9, the Cave Nebula. Right on. Very cool. Yeah, that's great. I think this, it's been about a year since we've seen this. It has. It's uh, yeah. that's a, again a two minute four by four. That's terrific. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, like I said, I gotta. I should wrap wrap things up. But uh, yeah. and we're we're we've hit our hour. I thought we were gonna have trouble sort of getting it rolling tonight. It's just been 
great. I actually think this this Q and A system is working really well. I'm really I'm, I'm really glad they've implemented yeah, it. Yeah, a lot yeah. Easier. And now it seems to work across all the platforms, which is nice. I think we're just going to say if if you're not putting them in the QA, we can't see your comments. So, um, however, like Chris, uh, who is it here? Chris. Oh, I'm going to brutalize the name. Kazernia just posted the first attempt to photograph the Magellic Clouds with EOS M and an 85 uh, millimeter lens. I would love to see that picture. So yes. if you haven't already, uh, share it at me and I would love to take a look at it. Um, were there any other comments or questions that you saw, Scott? Uh, not that I'm seeing. Uh, yeah, the, the new the new the Q and A app is really taking yeah. out more than yes. on YouTube. Siphoning up all the pictures, all the comments. So this is great. I wonder where the comments will show up afterwards. Will they be associated? With... That's a great question. Yeah. But uh, my favorite comment so far: is Sterling said that he only paid twelve dollars for his oil filter. But that was a <laughs> right. <laughs> Have you tried attaching oh. an oil filter to your telescope? <laughs> yeah, you, you should. I, I yeah. should see what happens there with it. it. Might get this nice little haze. <laughs> but it'll be slick. It's Dr. Stuart Foreman, the man Hello. who's been hiding in wow. the kidding from us. Stuart, how are you? Our doctor hey. won't tell us. Well, now that Stuart's here, let's all leave. Let's end the okay. show. Okay, yeah. bye yeah. now. <laughs> <laughs> how, is your, um, how is your telescope doing, Stuart? It wor- it's actually working fine. I, did, I had a really nice imaging night last night of, um, oh, it's I see something or other. Forgetting the yeah. name of it, it's I love uh, that. Um, I love yeah, that. Yeah, the I see something or other. It's a nice yeah. nebula um, in um, Auriga. Um, Ar- I'm I'm blocking on the name, but yeah, you it's know, somewhere I, in the in the up. That's in the, it's up dark. up in the sky. Yeah. You know, and it's kind of blurry and red. It's in it's in the universe's planetarium yeah. show that I love. Just pointing my camera up at. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, it's it's working great. Yeah, I'm I'm very happy with the focuser. It's 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 like a brand new focuser. Oh, great! Yeah, that's great. Very good. I can't wait to see, can't wait to see it uh, next week when yeah. the skies are clear for you. Yeah, I hope so. That'd be great. I have great. one more photo for you, Fraser. All right, I'm ready. I, I'm just downloading it now. I brought my other scope online just for you. <laughs> Did oh, you nice. really? Aww. I see what you've done here. I'm ready. I'm going to say goodbye to people then, so and then we'll look at uh, Roy's last image. So, Gary, it is so great to have you back. We missed you. I'm really glad to be back, even with the cold. And, uh, and Stephen, welcome to the uh, Star Party. It would be great to get the live images. So Yeah, I'll work on that. We'll, we'll do the cloud busters. So. <laughs> right. We'll get... And then just keep your feral children off the, uh, off the telescope. <laughs> <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Like just climbing around like monkeys on your telescope. It's ugly. Yeah. It's like free range kids. <laughs> I know the feeling. Um, Tom, glad you could jump in. Thank you. Yes. Sorry for the cold, but uh, no, this is this is always fun. I think half of us have a cold, so. Yeah. yeah. Tis the yeah. season. I'm I'm and looking forward to Thursday when it's gonna get in Canadian temperature. It's gonna be like about minus twenty here in Portland. Oh, that's nice. fun. Does that mean it's going to be cold here too then, isn't it? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's got a major front coming down south. Really? Yeah. Oh. Everyone here in California is freaking out because instead of it being 26 Celsius, it's going to be 17. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear. No. Oh, it's so cold. I, I was in Portland once in the snow, and the city actually just it came to a complete standstill. Nobody, nobody knows how to drive, drive in the snow in Portland. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's only like a couple of inches. We don't get that much snow. Yeah. It's really surprising. No, same here. People just don't know what to do with snow. And even though we're Canadians, we're the laughing stock of the country. Yeah. <laughs> oh, come on. No. Yeah. Don't know how to drive in snow, but boy, do we know how to drive in rain. So, <laughs> um, cool. All right, so Roy, what's our last picture? There it is. Ooh, looks wow. really pretty. Oh, but this is from the old. This is your other telescope online. Yes, I, I had. You were lacking color, so. You brought the color. I brought Yay. the color. You did it. Hey, that's awesome. Cool. Okay. Um, and of course, Scott Lewis. Thanks for uh, helping me keep this whole machine running. I really that's it, that's what we're here for. So I uh, put it into the Q and A app as well, just to, as a reminder. We are on Facebook and Twitter as well as YouTube and Google Plus. Uh, what do you have going on this week, Fraser? 
Well, tomorrow we're going to be doing astronomy cast. I have no idea what the topic is. Um, space stuff. Space stuff. We're going to be shooting. Uh, Jay is showing up. To, that's what I'm going to be picking up from the airport. Jay is showing up tonight, and we're going to shoot another eight, ten videos this week. Nice. So, yeah, we've got a whole pile of videos we're going to be doing. Um, what's it? Like, where did Saturn's rings come from? And um, I remember all the topics. But what's great is we're, we're going to be incorporating all of the interviews that we did down at Los Angeles. So you're mm -hmm. going to see the first one we did with Thad is going to be coming out on Thursday, and it's great. And Scott is yeah. in it. So hey, it's Scott. on on your site. Yeah, on Universe Today on, on the YouTube on, and on Universe Today. Yeah. Well, yeah. So, but so they did. Why does the moon shine? And then we've got, uh, and then a whole bunch of more videos over the next pretty much three months are going to be incorporating these interviews that we did. So. I'm really excited. Having, having seen the sneak preview of the video, look forward to it. It's really good. Yeah, it was good. Excellent. Plus, plus you know, I'm in it, so yeah, why wow. wouldn't you want to see it? Scott, Scott <laughs> brings the quality. Um, well, and, and the shine on his head, too. I, well, I was yeah. always yeah. by that. Are you kidding? Get, you got, you got get a little kiwi forward. polished for his head. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, see, so we cool. have a weekly space hangout coming up? Uh, yeah, oh, that'll be on Friday. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, and the learning space on Wednesday, I think. So, yeah, no, yeah, it's good. So. As always, as usual, a very busy week. And uh, we're all going to be back reporting and lots more news coming out this week. So everyone yeah. took it easy last week, and so I think everyone's going to get really rolling next week. So yeah, should have a Space Fan News out uh, Friday as well and all sorts of different things going on. Cool. All right, well, I'm going to oh, wrap up. And I sent you an invite. You have a doodle poll for days to be available for this year in Astronomy Hangout. With the folks from uh, Deep Astronomy? Yeah, right? so yeah. Uh, Tony and I are putting it on. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I, I apologize. I will get back to you on that. Yeah. Cool. All right, Do well, it. thanks, everyone, for joining us. Thanks for watching. Really appreciate it. I'm glad we were able to get three telescopes rolling, even with this sort of turkey madness. Um, <laughs> but, uh, and yeah, take my advice. Move your Thanksgiving back a month. Uh, it works for us. So, all right. <laughs> No, I actually, these, these would be two different days. <laughs> it's just some other holiday. Every other yeah. month, you have a, have yeah. a holiday. Perfect. All right. <laughs> okay. We'll see you guys later. Bye, Bye everyone.